it's DraftKings with the two best in the industry, making thousands. We'd make hundreds of millions if they would let us even put down that kind of action. But uh, back with Dirty G and uh, Diggle Sauce here. Um, also, just Glenn and I'm Nick. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we, we got an exciting night of fights on Saturday. We will be um, laying down massive action because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's another – because we can. Well, what, um, what casino are we going to be at? Well, uh, Rivers. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah, boy. Um, so, hey, let's uh, let's get this started with the uh, the Invicta champ Frey taking on Jin Yu Frey taking on um, Kay Hansen. This is a bit of an interesting fight because Frey is. Uh, technically they're Adam weight champion, which is 105 pounds. So she's going to be giving up some weight to, which, uh, that doesn't exist in the UFC today, just as probably a lot of people know that, but if does you that make, yeah, I was going to say, does that make sense to anybody out there that the UFC owned organization Invicta has an Adam weight division, but then they don't have it in the UFC. It's like, why even, what, what are we doing here? Just I make an just Adam weight hoping, division. Yeah. They're just hoping they find somebody good and, and suck them up like 10 pounds. But there's a couple of good, you know, girls that could fight Adam weight, I think, but to be exciting. But anyways, so I digress. But Kay Hansen, Frey, um, Hansen, you know, it, it's she's the favorite in this fight. Um, I think she can get co- from the tape that I've it's not a good fight. I'm going to say that right now. But um, from the tape that I've studied, um, Kay Hansen probably deserves to be the favorite. I think 165 is pretty steep. Um, it's getting bet down. It opened at 175, and she's getting bet down. But I think the consensus is is that Kay is going to be able to control and win rounds because she's bigger, and she'll be able to have top control, assuming her wrestling plan is, you know, her game plan is wrestling based. Um, but to me, I think Frey is probably the more accomplished um, striker and uh, a little bit crisper. So I don't know. It's not a great fight, but uh, I think it's probably. Uh, decision-based fight and DraftKings. So um, I've went back to my single entry ways, which has been successful for me, and I will definitely not have any of this fight. Yeah, the uh, the only thing is, I, I looked at it too, and I saw the same thing. So Kay looks like she's a more dominant wrestler, grappler, uh, probably a little bit bigger. And uh, the the other girl, her name is uh, was it Fre- Jenny Frey. Frey. Jenny Frey. Uh, she she looks like. I don't know, like kind of flat footed. And I didn't see her I didn't see her like really moving around very well. Like her her foot mo- her her foot movement was very, very flat. And it's not like very good. I see her throwing strikes, but a lot of the strikes that I saw her throwing in her most recent fight were not connecting. It was like she was just punching air, like backpedaling and throwing out shots like to look busy or to I mean, some of that's testing the range and getting comfortable, but not in like round two, you know, like three minutes in. Like you should have the range some some idea by then. Mm-hmm. So my thought though is uh, Kay actually has quite a few submissions on her track record. I could see her taking Frey down and subbing her, which would be a total GPP buster because nobody knows who these two are. One of them's an atom weight. Like I think Kay could be a GPP sleeper, and I think there's a good. I think that's probably chance. a good play. Yeah, that's probably a good. I mean, she. Minus one, you know, in that range of where she's at, she's she's pretty sizable favorite in this fight yeah the only problem on DraftKings is that she's like uh i've got her on my trial running she's 8500 so it's like it's it's not cheap like there's other other dudes in the 8500 area or like a little bit north of there that are probably more interesting but you gotta you gotta make choices so i i kind of like it like uh i think it's kind of a nasty play like it's probably 10 percent ownership yeah. it could I totally think... ruin your night but it might be awesome well you know, you always got to look at it in context, right, of the other fighters in that range. And um, when you look at, like, Maurice Green, Takashi Saito, Philippe Linz, um, you know, Poirier, I think people are naturally going to gravitate, obviously, toward Poirier for sure. But, uh, you know, Green is a bigger favorite, I believe. Um, and um, so Green's a bigger favorite, much bigger. And... Uh, so I don't know. I don't see a lot of people clicking the K Hansen button. Yeah, I'm, I'll tell you right now. I'm going to hit it at least once because I, yeah, I want to like have a, a taste. 
There you go. I love to see it. You love to see it. Let's I'm get to Yusef Zalal. Trying, trying to get out there, trying to expand off the chalk and, and yeah, find yeah. interesting plays. I'm looking Yusef, for value bets, actually. Yeah. Yusef uh, Zalal versus uh, Jordan Griffin. This is an interesting fight because Zalal, to me, in the tape that I saw, has a pretty um, a pretty good striking game. He doesn't put himself into trouble very much. Um, he doesn't hit particularly hard. He uh, He's more of a you know, kind of dance around the octagon accuracy type striker um, does have a pretty versatile striking game. I think that Jordan Griffin, a lot of sharps really like him from a gambling perspective. Um, people like his game. They think he has finishing ability and he's getting bet down a little bit. Um, so Zalal started as, you know, as a minus 125 favorite. And um, it's a little bit interesting. I think that, uh, this this might be a pretty good fight, pretty competitive. Yeah, I so I kind of I went back and forth on this a little bit because the odds in the fight it's basically it's a wash like depending on what book you're at. Zalal's minus one twenty five, making his walk for the second time. Griffin plus one hundred five. I think Griffin actually is meaner. Like I think he hits harder, mm-hmm. and I think he has like a little more a real good him. yeah, real good submission game too. Um, Griffin should be the better grappler, like decidedly better grappling advantage. And from a competition standpoint, he's fought the better competition. So, um, and more of it. Zalal hasn't exact like blown any doors off coming into the UFC. Um, yeah. looked kind of tentative in, um, the fight with, um, Ling- uh, lingo. So at least to me, you know, I think Griffin's the side that I want, um, you know, Jordan Griffin losing to Dan Iggy. I mean, that's you, that's, you can't fault you know. the guy for losing to like a surging Dan Iggy, even yeah. like a few fights ago when it was heavy grappling. Like, he didn't. That's the thing is that's my claim about Jordan Griffin is he looked okay against Dan Iggy. Yeah. And he loses to, to Skelly, who's also like a you know, a difficult guy. If you're if your game is grappling, Skelly can be really difficult. So um Dude, if your game is being in the UFC, Skelly can be really good, difficult. Like yeah, he's a it, freaky weirdo. His fight against Bobby Moffitt, the great Bobby Moffitt from the South Side, yeah. uh he it just got overturned today. So I don't know exactly why or whatever, but I think it was just like terrible judging, like egregiously yeah. bad judging or something. And uh, they overturned it today. I saw it in the news. It was like uh, Chaz Skelly and Bobby Moffat, the Wolf Man, back in the news. But, I think uh, he's from like Crete. He's from like Crete, Illinois, or somewhere. It's like, like yeah. the farthest south suburb you can go before the cornfields open G- up. G- uh, Gita, Clay Gitaville. Um Yeah, a little bit east, but like in the same yeah. general vicinity. So uh, we can get to the next fight because I think we both like Griffin. All right, all right. So um, what do you think about betting this one? I, I like Griffin at, at, at even. I think I think the value is certainly on Griffin because when you look at the competition standpoint, and we always do, um, I mean, yeah, if if Yusuf stays, keeps the fight on the feet, which we don't know if he can. Um, he actually, I think, wants to grapple, but I just don't see any power behind it. And I don't yeah. see any like slick submissions no, happening either. I, I think that um I think I'd be willing to take Jordan Griffin up to like minus one twenty five. Probably be my like if he gets if he I'd continue to bet him until that that range. So I like him at eighty two hundred too in DraftKings. Yeah, he's uh at the at the new Rivers Casino over in Illinois, Chicago. Uh he's at minus one oh six right now. So I'll probably take yeah. a piece. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And they have so, a deposit bonus, two fifty match code. Feel hook free, him, enjoy. Hook them up. Um, Ramiz Brahimash, yes. against Takashi Saito. The Iron so, Turtle. So, yeah, so Saito is, is an his interesting name, Iron guy. Turtle? He actually, so Bilal Muhammad, who just fought last card, and look, that was one of the best fights on the card. What what an amazing fight that was. Um, Bilal has always been a real tough guy in the UFC, a real tough out. And uh, Saito actually looked good until he didn't in that fight. Um, and, uh, you know, he did what he had to do against Saunders, which is knock him out like everybody else. Um, yeah, but that's like a gimme. In yeah, fact that it, yeah. In fact that it takes two rounds is suspect. Okay, but Brahim is... It is. Um, it is. I, I don't have... 
a lot of footage on Brahimic and uh, or Brahimov, and uh, what I did see didn't look particularly like impressive to me. Um, and these debuting fighters, you know, worry me. In the times of COVID, they have not done very well um, at all. And uh, Saito is yeah. probably a rightful favorite. I don't like betting a lot on Saito. I think minus 135 is kind of steep because we've seen the odds go from minus 185 to 135. So there's been action on Ramiz Brahimij. Um, but, uh, but this is, again, this is, uh, this is a fight I, I don't know what to do with. I don't know if you've got any insight on it, but I'd probably yeah, lean yeah. Saito. So, but, uh, but, man, I don't, I don't know what to do with this one. I'm totally opposite. Uh, so I, I also was looking, if you go over the list, like there's, it's kind of difficult to say like, which, which underdog is your lock of the week. Cause there's like a couple kind of close fights or like questionable, like you don't really know how it's going to go. And I think Brahimic could be awesome. And the reason is, is because he's like heavy takedown guy. He's, uh, he's the exact same height as Soto. Oh, I think you know what? I'm mistaking this guy for someone else. For, I did uh, watch this guy. Tom he's Worthy? in LF. No, he's mistaken for Kama Worthy. <laughs> no, I I'm sorry, I messed this up. Um, yeah, I the podcast is ruined. Yeah. Um, I messed up. I looked up the wrong guy. This, you were this, looking at Julian Arosa? No, I was looking at somebody from last week. I think. <laughs> okay, well, let me give anyways, the, the running so out. that's my bad he because might. I did see this guy in LFA, and he's. He uh he's the one didn't he he was fighting a dude with like uh, an afro and he was just smashing him all over the place in LFA is it, am I yeah, now and now we're on the right guy yeah he's every one of his fights like there's not a ton of footage it's like there's like bits and pieces of different fights he's been in and uh, he basically gets takedowns immediately like he he doesn't mess around it's double legs or like hard single legs that he pulls in high and he's taking people down. He looks. Uh, I like. I like the way that his posture is once he gets down. He's like uh, he folds at the hips and he's just heavy with his chest on top of guys. And then he actually punches. Like you see him throwing strikes and advancing position. The whole thing looks good to me. Um, also, Sato when he fought Bilal Muhammad. Bilal Muhammad's kind of known as like this wrestling takedown guy who mixes in boxing. And uh, Bilal's takedowns are like he basically does a lot of like double underhooks, like down low by the waist, and he tries to, like pick guys up and like wwe slam them to the mat which is all good except it's not super technical so maybe it's like something you got to think about but anyways uh he when he got a hold of sato every time when he got the the two hooks or just around the waist he sato kind of just like froze like i there's several times where he would he would be behind him and like sato would be like with his shoulder here on the cage he'd be like leaning in Bilal's got the two arms underneath him by his waist. And Sato put his arm like behind Bilal's neck. And I was like, this isn't the right defense at all. Like you should be turning into him, right? So mm-hmm. I don't think he has like incredible ability to to Wrestle one like escape the, the the cage wrestling. I don't think he understands pummeling or like turning into guys. And I really think that if this guy has any takedown ability that translates to the UFC, mm-hmm. he's gonna land some. And Sato's not gonna like spring up. I mean, he's He's going to – it's one of these, like, Calvillo, Jessica I things. Like, Sato, the Iron Turtle, hits hard. This guy can take you down. If he takes you down three rounds, if he gets two takedowns, I don't think Sato hits that hard, though. Like, I mean, he's not, like, a puss, but I, like – Yeah. He's – I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I don't he's think he's, like, one-punch KO power guy. Well, you can see that from the Ben Saunders fight where he just, yeah. just slowly, slowly sucked the life out of Ben over two rounds. Yeah, so we'll get off this fight because I've already embarrassed myself. But uh, Brahimaj is do, do also agree, though, also or? also guillotined a guy from what I remember too. He he like he uh, he choked a guy like completely unconscious with a guillotine. So that I'm usually takes Brahimaj. Yeah, that usually takes a pretty tight squeeze. So um, also here's the great thing about Rivers over in Chicago, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, these odds are spread pretty wide, but if you pick dogs, the odds are spread in your favor. So. I don't know if that helps anyone, but I just got him on. I got him at plus one twenty right now. Yeah, I mean he's uh, he's going off usually at uh, plus one ten everywhere else. So that's probably good value. Um, the next fight that I see is 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 new. It's a fresh fight. It looks like Arosa versus uh, Woodson, right? Because Woodson's fight got canceled. Did they even move it? They moved it in the order. Yeah, I think it's yeah they moved it. Um, so Woodson will be fighting Arosa 
who um are you on, which one are, are you looking at odds or sure dog or DraftKings? Or yeah i on? can't find a rosa on DraftKings at He's all not on yet. yeah okay but they're gonna load them on there probably a minimum um let's do uh before I jump there let's do the felipe lins and tanner on the ufc website i'm just going up in order Okay. Um, Linz, I like better than Bozer. I think both these guys are undersized heavyweights. Um, yes. Linz, Linz is the better striker. No, he didn't look great against Andre, but if you watch that fight, Andre stayed like 50 feet away from him, and uh, yeah. it was really a, a, a annoying fight to watch. And he also Bozer, kicked the shit out of his legs, and I don't think he's experienced anything like that, like the yeah, range kicking. Right, and I don't think Bozer has that in his game. Um, and Bozer <laughs> will... I don't with, think so. Yeah, Bozer will just get in the pocket and just get get hit. I mean, I, you know, Bozer is a heavyweight. Again, heavyweights can always end the fight because they're heavyweights. But Felipe Linz, I think, is a real good play here. Um, I like him. Um, I think the only reason this is even a pick 'em fight is because Linz um, lost to Arlovsky. And uh, again, Arlovsky is pretty dusty, but he had a really good game plan in that fight, which was stay out of Linz's boxing range, kick legs, and kind of dance around. So. Um, Boser, that's not his game. He's not going to do that. He's not going to be able to re- replicate that. And uh, I think he's he's just going to get pieced up. I So it's like when you have two bad fighters, sometimes they just run to the middle and knock each other out. <laughs> and it's like it's probably kind of what's going to happen here. Because Felipe Linz is former PFL champion, and I think he had like four TKO wins or something before. That no, he, he's, got, he's got good hands. He's got good hands. He can yeah, and put he, combinations he, together. Even against Arlovsky, you saw like – when he was throwing, he was throwing with, like, some power behind it. And yeah. if some of those connect on the chin, I mean, not maybe one or two, but, like, you definitely are going to feel it and start to slow down. And Tanner Bozer's the opposite. Doesn't he work at a strip club in Canada? Yeah, he's just terrible. He just gets he's hit. A, and he's, he's like a bouncer at a club, I think. Yeah, it's just – So, but he's he's there to fight. Like, he's game. He's yeah, he's totally going to throw, throw a lot of shots. He's going to throw volume. Um, so he's going to stand there and he's going to fight. And, uh, I think that plays right into what Linz wants to do. And, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't particularly see any way that Bozer really wins and except unless he, you know, drops him and, and you know, knocks yeah, him the, off. I think the way it wins, it's like, it's going to, this is like the classics, like, I don't know, classic, but it's, it's a cool fight in a way because Linz is probably more powerful and he wants to box. And in the last fight when he was fighting, he couldn't really do that. He had, like, bad range management. He had trouble getting inside the pocket. Like, he was having trouble landing shots. Bozer's going to be there to be hit. All of them, mm-hmm. like, in a triangle. Like, he's built like the marshmallow man. He's, a, like, a not a fit heavyweight. And, um, so, Bozer's going to be there. But Bozer's probably going to throw more volume. And if Bozer can just eat shots like the strip club bouncer is, I'm pretty sure, like, he could tire Linz out even. And then overtake him at the end. So I think it's going to be a cool, like, either get busted in the first first half of the second or get worn out. And then Tanner Bozer's, like, jiggly belly is all up in your grill for the last three minutes of your life in there. Um, yeah. So interesting. Um, but I'll take Linz in that one. Um... <laughs> I, I think that, like, uh, realistically, the odds on that, it's probably, like, if I had to just get, I'd say it's probably, like, Lynn should be like minus 280 or something. He's and, minus 115 right now. Right. Or 110. But He's a pick him. Th- but, you know, we've never really seen a lot of footage from these guys at UFC level. And I think that it'll be interesting to see a smaller heavyweight with a gas tank. Uh, unlike like, uh, you know, if somebody's like Big Ben Rothwell, who's like out of breath after four minutes, you know, it's like, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I don't count Tanner Buzzer out completely, but I think eight times out of 10, he's probably going to lose. And we like those on um, pickup fights. Um, next fight is the uh, well. Did this fight get canceled, Glenn? Uh, Maverick versus Barella. It's so it's not it's not totally uh, canceled yet, but uh, Barea is still available. But uh, Maverick is out, and they said she had some kind of an injury, and so she pulled out. And uh, yeah, All I right. mean, so we'll just skip it for her. now. Yeah, we'll yeah, skip Barea it now. real quick though. Barea, uh, no matter who they're going to plant in there even on two days notice, like you should consider the other person, the, mm-hmm. the Maverick. I wasn't real thrilled with her, like grappling kind of style, but Berea is super bad. Her, mm-hmm. she's averaging like 22 strikes a fight. I mean, it's like horrible stuff. Mm-hmm. So the only advantage of size experience, things like that, but she is super bad. So keep an eye out on that. That could be depending on the pricing for DraftKings, could be interesting. 
Yeah, agreed. Um, let's go to – do we want to do the Sean Woodson fight then? Yeah, Versus dude. Rosa? You what bet on this it? bomb in Who? Vegas when we were there. What, you did. Woodson? Yeah, you yeah. bet on Woodson. Like, he and, he, and, he de- and he destroyed Bokniak. Yeah, and it was like, I think Bokniak's going to win. And you're like, I like Woodson. And I was like, this dude sucks. And then he, he lands 111 significant Yeah, he looked, he looked good. And, and I think he was there. a huge underdog, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And he's huge. He's a huge man. I like to watch him because he looks like an alien um in there and i mean i mean no disrespect to the man because he he probably cuts more weight than i don't know how the hell he fits in, in there the fact that this guy fights at that weight class is just unreal to me dude he uh, looks like ben saunders love child i, I like i don't a know younger, skinner skinnier balder yeah, white but guy. rosa is gonna have nothing for him i mean i just the guy that's gonna beat woodson is somebody that has stopping power and uh and you know is just like a crisp striker and i think nelson um was probably a closer fight and i think i think arosa is just gonna get erased uh it, what day it's wednesday like he just got announced today right so mm-hmm. where he's probably in like california i'm guessing uh it's gonna take him like a day to pack his bags and get to vegas thursday you're doing media stuff friday you're fighting saturday like you gotta cut weight somewhere in between He's probably sitting at home eating cookies last night. And now, eating cookies and hanging out. We don't like those guys. I I think it's going to be a tall order. And also, uh, from what I, I looked at some of their roast tape, he lost to Julio Arce, who's not like amazing, but he's like an average kind of prelim guy. And I think that his game plan is going to be like mostly striking. Uh, I don't think he's going to be trying to take down Woodson. And I think Woodson's going to love it because he's going to be able to unload 120 strikes on a guy with like, potentially like a short weight cut and maybe not the best cardio ready to go. Bad defense too. Arosa is hittable. So um, that's, you know, again, the, the odds tell you, you know, it's five to one. The odds are crazy. Yeah. He's minus five ten, but there is actually, you know, five ten is kind of high. Right. But I mean, you know, this is one of those situations in DraftKings. I mean, if he, he lands 110 significant strikes and KOs this guy, like, you're going to need him at 8,800. So um, he's probably the most popular fighter on DraftKings, him and Poirier, I would guess. Woodson? Yeah. What uh, What about Mickey Gall? No, not like popularity in terms of name recognition. I'm talking about popularity in terms of like who um, who's going to – like highest own on DraftKings. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think Woodson's going to be that high. I think – there's probably like uh, really, it, I think yeah. Gonna be heavily owned. I think Poirier and uh, Hooker are going to be like cl- somewhere around like forty, fifty percent. Um, I think you're going to see. Well, we can get to it, but Pena, I, I think, Pena, yeah. Perry. So Woodson, devastation, highly owned. Um, Kama Worthy and Lewis Lewis Pena, um, the great Kama Worthy. Um, and the favorite. great and the great violent Bob Ross. I mean, you, you really love you do love to see it here. Um, Worthy is like my spirit dude, animal. I love just him. absolute um, characters of the UFC here. Kama Worthy, who meme KO'd Devonte Smith as like a plus what five hundred fifty underdog. Crazy. Um, crazy. Huge huge upset there, and uh, the violent Bob, the violent one, violent Bob Ross, just the, the most incredible nickname ever. Um, who actually has some skills is gonna is gonna. I think this is gonna be a challenge. I mean, Kama comes from a pretty extensive uh, amateur background. I mean, just what a name! Nicknames are just amazing here. De- the Death Star um, against Violent Bob Ross. It's just amazing. But uh, <laughs> but I do like uh, Luis Pena here. Um, I know Worthy's your spirit animal, but but I think Pena has just got such a big edge on the grappling, and then if he can clinch with Worthy and uh, and just basically backpack him this whole fight, uh, it's going to be. You know tough. something weird about this though? Um, I was that was my initial thought on it, but looking at DraftKings, do you know that Luis Pena only lands one takedown per fight? Like, yeah, he's that's not a good. It. He's he, never done more. Yeah, he's not a good wrestler per se. He's like a decent scrambler and he does like body locks and things like that, more clinch style work. I mean, he's not necessarily trying to get it to the ground, 
Um, but he's very, he's just a very good grappler. And typically when he does get the fight to the ground, you're probably not going to get up. Um, he just, he's a good grappler. So he has, uh, he has a lot of advances and reversals though, once he's down there. Yeah, because he gets the back. I mean, he's very, very adept at getting the back. And I think if he gets Kama's back, he's going to be able to choke him out because yeah. I don't know how accomplished Kama worthy is on the ground. I mean, it's hard to find the regional footage of him like really grab. You can't even look at it. You can't even look at it because there's like young Kama worthy. And then there's Kama worthy, the death star in the regional tape. And yeah. it's like, he looks like a boy. There's like five videos of him that look like a boy. And it's like, this is terrible. And then you see him when he comes out and it's like this, like orange faded, like camera. And he's just like moving around and like, looks really good. So, I mean, at least as good as you can look on the shaky cam. But, I mean, when I saw that tape, I was like, yo, this guy might yeah, actually we, be able to win. Him. That, that is a true story on my bachelor party in Las Vegas, right? Or, uh, no, I was in Atlantic City. But uh, uh, in Las Vegas, it was a different. It was my, it was my pre-bachelor party with my, uh, my wife's family. Um, they all brought me to... Um, eat chicken wings and bet on fights. And I, uh, I absolutely fired a plus five fifty at comma. And we, we took, we stole the show with that one. Yeah. I, and the thing was, it was because it was so hard to find tape on that guy. And I remember like, it was on like a Thursday afternoon or something. I think I sent it to you and I was like, yo, watch this one. And yeah. it was like, Oh, he like, he strikes. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah he like blasted somebody. So it was off his back. Like, okay. But Pena, you know, for Pena's worth, you know, Pena can take a shot. Um, so I, man, this is this is a tough one. But but the thing about Pena, he hasn't fought like huge power punchers, right? So this could be, you know, for Vola, for Vola is probably the the yeah, worst but, case for him today. Yeah, right. But for, again, for Vola, um, a powerful dude gave gave Violent Bob some some trouble. His strength is. You know, yeah, and you power. saw too, even in like the the exchanges where they were like, like re- uh, reversing, advancing, uh, when they're moving around in the grappling, that's when you saw some of the shots land, and you could tell it was like a problem for Pena, like, like he couldn't take a lot. He, it's uh, he's not one of these guys who's like, I don't know, he's, you can just see it, like it's like he's not taking it well, and he's not used to getting hit really hard. He's used to controlling the range, putting his hands out, and then like pop, like take one, and then keep yeah. moving. So here's the interesting thing about Kama, the Death Star, is if I'm in Kama's co- corner, if he rushes Pena and just starts firing, like Pena might be, it might be short, it might be a real short night. Yeah, so the the one thing I'm trying to extrapolate in my brain here is, like, he has one fight and it was over in the first round, right? So you don't really know how this is all going to shake out. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was no grappling in that. It was just like a dink and Devontae Smith's out. So I'm looking at he's got he landed 21 strikes in the first round, and I think it was, like, not all the way over. There's probably a minute and a half or something left. So let's say he was landed, like, 26 strikes. So then over three rounds, if you can keep up the pace, he's sitting at, like, almost 80 strikes that's 40 points a win is 30 that's 70 it's hard to see where where you can take him just on striking alone like he yeah, you're basically yeah. yeah so the punch to drop Devante too it was like an over over the like Devante threw a right and then he came over with the left and you hit him an, on the it check it was actually a brilliant check hook i mean it really was a nice strike but um, should it have knocked most guys out well, that's the thing. When you're an accurate striker, I mean, is it Devante's chin or was it just a, you know, it is Kama just a good striker? I mean, I don't know. We're well, going to well, find out. The only thing you look at is his history, right? And so mm-hmm. his history is TKO, KO, decision sub, TKO, decision. And then he was getting dropped on his own. Like, so he's not like, he has a lot of TKOs. <laughs> he does. I mean, <laughs> that star. That's I don't know. Hard. It's like you know, but here's the good news. So I was I was checking it out and I was looking at all the angles here for some single entry business, and uh, Kama Worthy is seventy three hundred, and the other guy who I'm looking at is Mickey Gall is seventy two hundred. You can find oh, a way to I make. Like, I like Worthy much better than Gall. Oh sure, sure, but we'll, we'll get over to the the face tattoo man. But the thing is, it's like actually Mickey Gall is probably more reliable than Worthy, but. They're both cheap. 
so you can find a way to work one of each into a lineup and it's going to cost you three dollars five dollars and it's like it's not the end of the world uh but out of all these dogs too while we're on that general topic outside of hooker upsetting poirier which i'm not a fan of uh Dawkus, i don't like Dick poirier is horrible it's like <laughs> kyle nelson i wanted kyle nelson i thought that was interesting he's out so you got Worthy and Mickey Gall in the lower sevens, and that's it. So feel free. Play them both. Why yeah. limit yourself when Why you can limit enjoy yourself? both? You can enjoy life. So let's get to Maurice Green and Gian Vallant. Question of, do you, do you see value on the comma Worthy at plus 200? Oof. It's KO bust, but a little bit, yeah. I, I'd like it more if it's like plus 500. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd like it more if it was plus 500. Um, Gian Velash versus uh, Maurice Green. The Are you related to him? Uh, Velash? Velash. Gian Vianti? Velash. Um, let's, uh, let's have a light heavyweight step up to heavyweight and beat a heavyweight. That's usually what happens. So um, I actually think Maurice Green is just – no American dollars being bet on him whatsoever. The crochet Never. boss? Never. <laughs> you can do it if you want to, but I will not be um, betting on the, the boss of crochets. Uh, yeah, I I think that he's like kind of suspect. Yeah, he's, he's very suspect. I mean, so, and listen, v- Village hasn't beat anybody under 50 years old in a really long time. Um you know, it's and he's moving up to heavyweight. I mean, he's probably eating cookies, a lot of cookies, and hanging out. Um, and this is just a paycheck fight, but yeah, I mean, the Jeff Hughes fight was not good. He had no range control. He had a mm-hmm. small guy stepping in the pocket and lighting up his chin. Uh, Junior Albini wears a diaper, and I think has been released since, so he's toast. Pavlovich is a oh, big Russian, destroyed, destroyed, KO'd. Uh, Olenek is is another big Russian, but uh, slightly smaller and more of a submission guy. Two round subs him, so it's like, listen, crochet boss, like you're big, you're lanky. I think he needs to like speed it up into more of a uh, like a rangy boxing game, where if you come in, you're gonna pay. But he doesn't but use I don't... range well, and I think Valanche, if he does get close, I mean, crochet. Crochet boss has no zero wrestling. So if Vianche wants Volante, okay, I'm just well, he, he is a sub. If he wants, he's a long guy. Yeah, but I mean, he trains with why? I mean, he's been in the game for a long time. He can easily take him down if he wants to. I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm just saying like that won't shock me to see Green lose in some horrible fashion. Yeah, I. I but the thing is, too, is Volante is really bad. I mean, he was bad years yeah. ago. He's still bad. Yeah. The last real win he has was a split decision over Ed Herman. Mm-hmm. Uh, questionable. And then before that, it's Francimar Barroso in 18. I mean, he's he's losing to everybody. He's he's literally only being the biggest cans the UFC has to offer. Like, Saperbeck Safarov, you should bet against him now, in every here, fight here's ever. the thing, though. Is Maurice Green one of the biggest cans? I don't think he's one of the biggest. I'll argue that point. I think this is... Uh... And I think honestly, like going up to heavyweight's probably good for this dude. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. Like uh, for horrible. which guy? Which guy do you like? Volante, a heavyweight. I, I, if, if you had to make me bet on one of these guys, it would be taking taking. This is dog or pass written all over it for me. Yeah, I thought about that, but I think Volante's like output is horrible. So pass. Yeah, I mean, I, I will. I'm, uh, I'm looking Dick at like, Volante's. Dick House. He threw 80 strikes in a win through 74. Kyle, but he Dick scores House. horrible in fantasy. I mean, here's the thing, though. Do you think Volante has the ability to knock out Green on the feet, or do you think it's more likely Green knocks out Volante? I don't think anyone's getting knocked out. But I think Volante is going to get TKO'd. Okay. And also, he has like a track record of being unconscious. And the Green Machine, I think, has he got TKO'd by Pavlovich. I don't remember how that ended. If it was like a legit unconsciousness or if it was like a stoppage. Uh, uh, I Pavlovich. Just warned, is big. I warn the viewers: please do not <laughs> do much money on Murray's Green. 
if you're if you're betting paychecks on Maurice Green, blame him. Blame the the guy. No, in- listen, I I think they're both questionable at best, but it's like. Do you take the guy who's bigger and can probably get a knockout or the guy who's smaller and you know sucks? Like, Valente is not going to knock out Green. There's no he's way. He would have to. You're saying he's not going to finish him? I, t- I just don't think so. I don't think he can hurt him. He couldn't, he couldn't hurt Shogun. Like, he doesn't throw enough volume. Shogun, I mean, Shogun looks like he had about 12 beers before he gets into every cage and, like, he's just. Oh, like, you know, like I don't, I don't think so. Stop I, on Shogun. Um, let's. I love uh, Shogun, but I'm just saying at this point in his career, out. it's a different story. We're not. Also, we're I want to point agree on this. is a plus one ninety dog. Yeah. Not a great I, play. I, I, I kind of like this fight to go to decision. To be honest, that that's might be the bet. That's why it's dog or pass to me. What's the inside the distance? Minus minus two twenty seven. So that means your your decision prop is probably pretty good then. Yeah, plus one sixty two to bet that to go to decision, which it totally could because the volume's low and the power's low. Yeah, I think that's actually a good good call. Um, which if you're going to bet it to go to decision, you will avoid it in DraftKings at all costs. So, dog or pass for me. Okay. Or bet the decision prop. I think I think that's a good bet too. So let's go to the Dick House. Sleeping on Kyle Dickhouse. I listen. <laughs> me and you both love Brandon Allen. We're gonna. We think Brandon. I. I, I am gonna say I'm gonna play Brandon Allen on DraftKings. I'm gonna bet on Brandon Allen. He's gonna be a parlays. But we may be sleeping a little bit on a Dickhouse. We're not. I watched the tape. It, it's just total Dickhouse. It's all Dickhouse all the time with this guy. He's like. He's like a like a submissive striker. He's like, you ready to go now or no? You ready to go now or no? Have a kick, like smell my toes. He's he's got nothing for Brandon. Brandon Allen is like the next coming of I don't know what. what. He's the beast. And he is gonna roll through this dude. Like it's gonna be like you're gonna see the number six 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 like in blood on the ground after Brandon Allen kills this guy in the octagon. He's he's big. He tries to throw head kicks. He's passive. His output's bad. His wrestling is bad. His wrestling takedowns are bad. He only he's like a kickboxer. If that exists for like a tall white guy with flat feet, like that's all he's going to do. He's going to throw like jabs and throw kicks and it's going to last for about 15 seconds. And Brendan Allen's going to be like, let me give you a hug. And he's going to take him in. It's going to be like, let me rub your back. And then you're going to go to sleep. That's it. Yep. I think it's going to be fast. So we got Brendan Allen. We both got him. Parlay is drafts. Yeah. And it's easy to be like, Give me the minus 300 guy, but it's true. Yeah. Like, th- this is a total, total mismatch. This guy should not be fighting Brennan Allen. In fact, I think they're feeding him. Yeah. I think they're feeding the snake to get it bigger and bigger. So, uh, so let's go on to Gall and Perry. Um, I hate Mickey Gall. I think <laughs> Perry is going to knock him out. I think Perry's tough enough. He's not going to get taken down. He's way stronger. Um, I think Gall's going to try to crash into the clinch and, uh, Perry will shrug him off because he's way stronger and he will KO him with a sh- uh, with an elbow or a hook. Like this is, this is going to be, this is going to be, um, a meme KO. That's what I think. I mean, you might, just I, I, have, a, I like, have a hard time with this. I have a hard time with this one because every time you think of Mike Perry, you think of this guy with crazy power who knocks people out. But if we go to the actual track record, he gets. He was TKO'd by Jeff Neal. Jeff Neal's good. He loses a split decision to Vincente Luque, which he didn't knock out Luque. He Luque beats Alex. Awesome. Luque is an awesome fighter. He's tough too. He just lost yeah. too, but uh, no. He Al- just, Alex, he actually just won. Luque just won recently. Last week? Uh, no. not last. It was a couple weeks ago. That was Bilal Muhammad took him out. No, you're very wrong, sir. I, I was I was at dinner. I missed some of this. Hang on. No, Vicente Luque just had a oh, big win over Nico Price. The hell was, he was stopped the... Nico Price and he beat Nico Price's ass like I said he was going to, and you kept betting on Price. So stop sleeping on Vicente. Third Luque. round, Dr. Awesome. Stoppage, fight of the night. Give he, me a yeah, break. Nico yeah, Price was a great pick there. Sorry, I, I was thinking of the wrong guy. Uh, Alex Oliveira, that was like a slop fest, and Oliveira looked like he was high out of his mind while he was fighting. Yeah, that was he, interesting. Yeah, I remember that fight. Then he, but that was a decision that he won. 
He didn't knock yeah. out Oliver. Yeah, he uh I think okay, if I remember correctly, Cerrone armbarred him, but did Perry drop him first? So I don't think so. It was in the first round. Oh no, he I took th- him down. He took him down. Paul Felder, this is the greatest win of his current history. Split decision over Paul Felder. That tells me everything I need to know. And uh Max <laughs> Max Griffin. I mean, Max Griffin. Right. Okay, you're going to go to critique Mike Perry. Let's look at the actual footage. It takes me, it me, takes me tell until me what you see. 17 to tell get a Tell me KO. what you see in Mickey Gall that he can win. Tell me what you see. He's not Mike Perry. like Because the thing is, is there's this perception of Mike Perry, and then there's the reality of Mike Perry. Perception is he's this big, tough dude with big power, and he knocks people out. He hasn't knocked anyone out in almost four years. Okay. He's just losing. Like that's a I'll fact. give you that. I'll give you that. But and he's he's debatably I, lost one, two, three, four, five, almost six with a split decision out of seven fights in a row. Okay, and who has Mickey Gall beaten ah, that's still in the, the UFC? Great the great dilemma. It's still in the UFC. Yeah. yeah. So here's here's the None. dilemmas. Mickey Gall is not never beaten. Good. Mickey Gall has never beaten a UFC fighter. Ever. Never. What about Sage He Northcutt? has, he has He's gone, dude. There's no more Northcutt. Northcutt got Mike melted. Jackson. Northcutt got melted in one championship. He probably can never fight again. Like I yeah. think that he's, Mickey Gall is. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree too. I agree. Too. Avoid, but Big time I think it's like you, you have to be. You have to be totally aware of the fact, though, that Mike Perry is not this like crazy knockout guy. At least not anymore. And he's having a hard time putting wins together. Agreed. So is it you don't have to bet that, the whole bankroll, but I'm just but saying, like, is I, it crazy I don't say think that Mickey Gall could outpoint him on the feet and sub or, him. He could sub him, but or Perry, get like a takedown on the fence yeah. and, and Perry, around. Perry is very is a pretty strong, pretty strong dude. I mean, I don't know. Perry is always eating cookies and hanging out, so I don't, I don't. But again, toughness has been proven. Is he a one shot kill guy like he used to be? No, but uh, but I still think he has enough power to really put it on Mickey Gall. Mickey yeah. Gall, Mickey Gall has not fought like Mike Perry's of the world. He just hasn't. I agree, but and I when just... he did, he fought Diego Sanchez and got effing wrecked, dude. That fight wasn't even close. Yeah, he got like ragged up off San- but but uh, and Sanchez is a Perry's, smaller dude. Perry's, and Sanchez is yeah, a small Sanchez, one. Sanchez, he's Sanchez very is very small against Gall that night, and he was taking him down. I don't think Perry's going to try and take him down. I think he's going to try and take his head off, and I could see him getting outpointed. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. But I will not be putting any money towards Mickey Gall. I'm also and not if Mickey Gall. Perry. If Mickey Gall proves me wrong. Then we can we can reassess Mickey Gall. I'm just going off what I've seen in Mickey Gall. His striking is very rudimentary. His jiu-jitsu is pretty good, but he has no way to get to there against a guy like Mike Perry. So he's going to be trying to jab. There's a way. I mean, Perry's going to come in and try to kill him, and he'll be able to to grab him. Like, I I think there's probably like Mike Perry has one shot at winning, and it's like knocking him out because he's not going to outstrike him. He's he has to like basically put him away. Like he's at a point in his career where he throws too hard, he doesn't have enough volume, and he has like essentially no like like positive grappling where he can just like get a double leg, work positions, and start taking it over. He's just like aggressive. And if the aggression doesn't work out and he gets tired and Mickey Gall is just hanging out, I think he gets outpointed. Like I, I think that this is more of like a strategy matchup. It's not about like what they've done in the past. It's like what are they gonna do on Saturday? Fair enough. So you'll take Gall and I'll take Perry and we'll go from there. I'm going to have Gall in one as a dog. And also, okay. again, the problem is, is like there's not a lot of good dogs that you have to get to like even money to find someone who's maybe OK. For dogs, I mean, do you have like a secret dog that you like on the bottom? Yeah, we're getting to him right now. Uh, all right. Tell me your secret dog. His name is Dan Hooker. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah, but you need two. You need two. Do you? Yeah, you have to have two. What about Brahimash? Well, I've got him too. What about I'm on the Bra- I'm, a worthy. I'm on the Brahimash train. What about Yanche? I'll tell you what I'm going to do right now. I don't like Vaughn at all. I'm going to do Brahimash, whatever his last name is, and I'm going to have a Kama Worthy, and I'm going to have a Mickey Gall as the number two guy. There you go. So you're obviously on Poirier. 
And I can I, I just want to make my little shtick about Poirier really quick. Um, Poirier. Continue. Yeah, I always talk about this, and it may not be true, but I think that um, Poirier has had some crazy wars, and he's evolved over time. But that fight with Justin Gaethje was, to this day, one of the best fights I've ever seen in my life. And it I was think, insane. I think Dustin Poirier left a piece of his soul in that octagon. But uh, also, when you actually look at the technical um, like um, proficiencies of Dustin Poirier, he has really evolved over time with his boxing. Um particularly with his guard in the Max Holloway fight, Max Holloway complained a lot in his corner that Poirier defends very awkwardly because Poirier actually uses a, a shell defense where he'll put his arms up and block punches with his arms and shell. And he won't take shots right on the chin. So if you're throwing straight punches at him, he generally will, will roll with it and you'll be hitting elbows and you'll be hitting shoulders. And it's actually a very annoying defense because right after that, he counters with body hooks and it, and he's really developed his jab and he can switch stances. Um, another thing he does really well is body kick. He can body kick really well. Um, now Poirier does this thing where when he, when he smelled, so all that said, those are the positives of Poirier, a really awkward defense, strong stopping power in his hands, good hooks, good body, um, good body shots. And um, the negatives in his game is because of his boxing heavy style, he's very heavy on his front foot. So he gets very susceptible to leg kicks. Gaethje ate his legs alive. The calf kicks especially can really devastate him. And uh, the other thing that he's got is when he smells. They, they were all messed up. Like after that fight with Gage, there there were photos of them like in the hospital together because their legs were so messed up. Yeah. So the other thing too is that when when Gage or when Poirier smells blood, he typically rushes in with his hooks and he keeps his chin in the air. Um, so those are the two negatives that I see. Um, so in the fight with Hooker, um, I think that Poirier will need to stay behind his jab and really counter punch. If he gets too aggressive, I think that's going to cause problems for him. If he gets too ahead, ahead on his front foot, um, I think Hooker does is probably one of the best calf kickers in the game, and we've seen how kicks have changed fights lately. Um, this calf kick is one of the most effective techniques in MMA right now, and Hooker is one of the best at it. Um, to me, Hooker is continuing to evolve. He's continuing to get better. Um, I've loved everything I've seen out of Hooker lately, and I think those calf kicks are going to be a game changer early in this fight, and that's why I'm on him. Well, for me, it's real simple. I, I need almost no explanation. He decisioned with Felder, and so I'm just on Poirier. I uh, I can't accept the decision against Paul Felder, and uh, I'm just kidding. But uh, I the output is different. So the the strikes for Hooker in his last five round fight, he lands 122 in five rounds. Poirier has done like around 180 in two five round fights. So for me, that's a significant change. It's like a 30 percent higher output over five rounds. Uh, I think that Hooker also, like, he's if he scores like he does in these fights, like 95, 99, a little over 100. It's a five-round fight, though, by the way. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so but even in five rounds, he scored 99 against Felder. So I think Poirier is going to be more available to hit than Felder because he, like, wanders off in the octagon. But uh, I also don't think that he's going to be able to hit, land as many strikes because he's going to be eating a lot more. Like the output from Felder is way lower too, and he's like doing spinning back fist constantly, and it's like, it's he's not available to be hit or or take hits, but Poirier is going to be there and ready to go. So I think the canvas is set for these two to light each other up. Great but fight. I, I I like yeah, it's going to be good, but I like Poirier to win purely based on like cleanness of technique in the boxing. Uh, I think Hooker throws more like one, two punch combos and he reaches pretty far to get there. I think Poirier is going to be much cleaner in land in land combinations. And I also think that there's been some evidence that Hooker can fade. Uh, Barboza kicked his legs and the guy just kind of like stumbled forward and collapsed. Uh, you know, conversely, Poirier was getting kicked in the legs, not by Barboza, but by Gaethje for five rounds. He still walked out of there. You know, uh, I think it's just a little bit different mentality. And I think right now Poirier is probably peaking in his career. Like a year for, or two from now, it's probably a different discussion. But uh, I th think Hooker's rising and Poirier is peaking. And so I, I just think that it's like you have a guy who's basically the number one in the world uh, outside of Khabib. I, I don't think Hooker is number one in the world. 
So I will say that um, I personally think that Hooker is getting better every fight, and I think he's actually peaking. And we'll see if Poirier can sustain his peak because I think he peaked in that fight with Justin Gaethje, and I don't think he's the number one in the world. I think Gaethje is actually would would beat him now. And uh, so maybe, we'll, maybe, but and it, and so, yeah, but we'll you're totally see. right. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, this is this fight's going to be big for the lightweight division because, you know, there's a lot of things that happen once this fight takes place. If Dustin looks really good, um, he keeps that defense up. He, he counter punches. He can save his own leg. Um, he can he can finish hooker with body strikes like definitely the body strikes will play a different. There's clear game plans for both guys. I think it's um, you know, it, it's it's going to be a similar game plan to how Poirier fought Max. Right. Which is shell counter and work, you know, work the body via 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 hard hooks and um, body kicks. Um, similar kind of rangy style Dan Hooker has. But the difference is Dan Hooker is a much better kicker than Max. Um, much better. So that's going to be a little bit of, uh, of a difference. So we'll uh, they throw we'll different kicks, though. That's yeah, different. and and Hooker th- Hooker throws a lot of the calf kick, and Hooker throws a lot of knees up the middle. He throws a lot of elbows, which are going to be when when Poirier's crashing in. Those are very dangerous weapons: the knees up the yeah. middle and and the elbows. So um, that's why I like Hooker. I think he's a good dog play. I think the fight overall is really just an awesome fight, and uh, I wouldn't argue with you to 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 bet on Ho- uh, Poirier because I think that uh, Poirier is a great fighter. So. Um, so I yeah, we'll, it's a good we'll bet, opposite, like in, in value. It's not a it's not a great value bet, right? Like if you're betting on him, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm just gonna pay two twenty. It's like it's okay, but it's probably about what it is. Like I think the general population thinks that Poirier is probably a little bit better, and so he has the odds. The other thing too I want to point out though is he does have a greater than one strike per minute differential, uh, which we talked about like on DraftKings a thirty percent increase, and he also has more takedowns on average and submission attempts. So. The ways you win fights is with strikes, submissions, control, and it's like he has higher stats on the UFC website uh, than Dustin Hooker in every area. Dustin Hooker. What the? <laughs> <laughs> Hooker. Dust- yeah, sorry, Dustin Hooker. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's my pitch. I, I think it's basically volume and cleanness yeah. versus like a newer guy who's probably got to learn a little bit more. The arguments have been made. The bets will be placed, and we will see how it shakes out on Saturday night. Yeah, thank everybody and, for watching. Yeah, if uh, if you have any comments, questions, bets, criticisms, like or just hate mail, send it to the the YouTube. We'll read it later. Thanks. All right. Thanks.